Hello, hello. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me. This is usually how I start. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Just going to try to turn down my ringer. Can you type and let me know if you can hear me? Perfect. Hi, Sarah. I'm going to I'm just trying to turn down my phone and yes. Perfect. Let me do this properly. <clears throat> Hi, Zainab. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Sarah. Hey. Oh, there you go. Now. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I am doing okay. <laughs> Shoveled any snow yet? I refuse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse. You um, someone else to do it. My husband shoveled when he got home because I looked outside today and I'm like, no, don't want it. <laughs> Yeah. there's more coming <laughs> that's what they say but right now it's tapered off it snowed for probably a few hours and then yeah gone. i just checked the radar and there's there's more more coming unfortunately so. uh, oh well maybe this is the last hurrah doubt it <laughs> yeah, no I, I don't think so no we're, we're still not that far along yet so oh my gosh yeah uh, it's okay. It's better to talk about the weather than all the other crazy stuff going on in the world, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm curious to know where everyone's from on here. Uh, Zainab, Tracy, Chandra, and somebody is calling in. Where are you all from? Toronto. This is my third video situation of the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> notes. We did a couple of lives uh, earlier today talking about our book because I wanted to introduce the authors to the masses. So between yesterday and today, we've managed to introduce two of the authors. The third one we tried to introduce, but somehow the live didn't work well. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of exciting. I'm showing everyone. This is still my proof copy, but this is the book we just put out, it was a labor of love. It was one year in the making and it features five immigrant women entrepreneurs telling their story of, you know, how they moved here and managed to put together successful businesses and the challenges they faced. So mm -hmm. the stories are pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, for, and them. for them, yeah, I know, and to put it all on paper and to be, you know, vulnerable and to be mm -hmm. able to tell that story, it's, yeah. I'm very impressed. I was very happy, you know, when I got the submissions and everyone was reading it. So yeah, that made me, it was a good day, a good day. And then tomorrow we have a full day workshop. So it's kind of a busy week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So it's been a busy week on, on my end too, personally and, and, and work-wise. So February is a big birthday month in our family. So oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. My husband's birthday was yesterday and mine was the week before. And then my son's birthday is his actual birthday is this Saturday because he was born in a leap year. Oh, so, oh. Yes. Yeah. So he gets a birthday this year. Look at he that. Does. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason he thinks he's like nine or 10 years old. I'm like, no, no, dude, you're technically two, yeah. but you're turning eight. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so we have a big, as long as the weather holds out, there's uh, a big kind of dinner happening up in Collingwood on Saturday. So hopefully everybody can make it and the, yeah. the weather holds out, but if not, we can always just postpone it till the next weekend. So yeah. it is what it is. Can't control mother nature. That's a lot of birthdays in one month. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then my mom's was today too. I almost forgot to book my mom's birthday. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my husband and my sister's birthday is in February, but everyone else is scattered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So wow. We get, we get it all done in, 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 the, in, in February, too, which is typically a sh the shortest month, so. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm impressed with that because I don't know how I would handle that many birthdays. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I celebrate a lot in my family, so it would be yeah. bananas. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. We usually just, you know, for my husband's and I birthday, you know, it's just whatever it's our birthdays. Who cares? Just focus on Sean and, 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 and Nana. So those are the important people. Oh, it's okay. You're important to us. <laughs> Thank you. I am going to hand everything over to you. I, Oh, okay. I should probably introduce myself to those who might not know me. I'm really bad at that. I'm <laughs> doing, yeah. <laughs> I found a Canadian small business movement a number of years ago, probably about seven years ago. And we try to do these webinars a couple times a month and we will have a replay available on our YouTube channel and we try to share it throughout the year. And there will be a follow-up email to all the people who registered that will have the link to the video so they can rewatch. So we just try to provide resources for people who need it for their businesses. So via our website, via webinars like these, or via in-person events. So that is what we do. And now I am going to hand off to Sarah and how this is going to work is I'm going to run her deck on my screen because there's no need for you to have to see me, you know, reading the deck mm -hmm. while she speaks. And uh, Sarah, I, you can just say next slide whenever and I will just yep. forward to the next slide. Okay. And if you have questions, type them into the chat box or into the question box. I will try to monitor that. You see everything I see, Sarah, but I will try to pop in and monitor if there are questions and jump in. Okay, okay. perfect. Yeah. All right. So perfect. I will start sharing my screen and perfect. and your slide five looked fine to me. So just Okay, yeah. I when I reopened it again, it was there. Like I don't know, but it, it ended up working out. So I'm not okay. a huge techie person. So neither am I. Yeah. <laughs> It's all yours. Perfect. Okay. So thank you every, everyone for joining. My name is Sarah Bibb and I am the CEO and founder of MKS HR Consulting. I started my own HR consulting business five years ago. I'm in my sixth year, but I've been in human resources and recruitment for 16 plus years. So I've, uh, I've, I've seen a lot over the years. And the reason why I started my business is I work with more smaller, medium-sized employers who don't have um, their own in-house recruitment person or human resources person to lean on when they run across those issues. But when you're that size of a business, you still run across the same issues that the larger organizations do. You just don't have the luxury of calling up that human resources person on the fifth floor to ask a question or to hire someone. So that's where I come in and that's what I do um, for my clients. And so tonight um, I'm going to go through, next slide please, and we're going to um, talk about um, how to hire employees for your business, but most importantly, how to hire them right the first time. Because as more smaller and medium-sized business owners, it's a lot more crucial for you guys to make sure that you hire right the first time. Um, you don't have that hiring budget that larger corporations do. So if it doesn't go right, um, it, it's, it's a lot more it's a bigger impact to your business, essentially. So what we're gonna cover um, tonight is I'm gonna show you the same step-by-step um, -step process that I use for my clients that you can follow every time that you hire someone in your, in your business. So then you can make sure that you hire someone correctly the first time. You're gonna learn that there's a difference between a job posting and a job description and why you need both documents in your business. You're gonna find out some really good places um, to post your job ad online. You're going to walk away with a formula for creating behavioral based interview questions and I'll go over what those questions are and why you want to use them. We're going to go over some rules and regulations, what you legally can and can't say or do. And then I'll touch on um, some policies. Um, so basically, once you start hiring employees, especially when they're on your payroll, you definitely need to start having policies. But the question is, is, you know, which ones do you need? Next slide, please. Perfect. So um, you think that, you know, you've gotten to the point in your business where you think that you need to hire, be it, um, you know, you've already hired a few employees and, and maybe you're ready to, to make that next hire, or maybe you're ready to make your first ever hire where you're no longer going to be that solopreneur anymore. Well, where do you start? Do you post up a job ad, interview people, and then hire somebody? Not quite yet. Um, there's something that I actually um, think is a much more important, important first step before you go ahead and post a job. And so next slide, please. And so 
that's where the staff cost benefit analysis comes in. So you're going to basically do a cost benefit analysis to find out, you know, are you actually at that point where you are ready to hire? And so one of the main reasons why you'd want to do this analysis is to truly understand, you know, do you absolutely need to hire? Can you afford to pay someone else? Do you have enough work to justify hiring somebody? Is the hours going to be part-time hours or full-time hours? Are they going to be an employee on your payroll or are they going to be an independent subcontractor? So you kind of have to think about things, those things before you go ahead and post that position. And then you're going to look at the costs of, of what it what it means to hire somebody, the hard and the soft costs. And I'm going to go through that in a little bit. And then the benefits, basically, what value is that person going to bring you within the first year of their employment or the second year of their employment? So in the next slide, we're going to go over um, some costs. So the, the list that I have here in terms of the costs, it's not all of them. There's many more um, that you have to think of, but these are the ones that, that are um, the biggest things that I think some people might not um, think of. So if you're hiring someone on your payroll, you obviously have to pay them their base wage rate, which in Ontario is $14 an hour. You cannot pay them any less. If there's other people on the call that might be in, in different parts of Canada, you would just have to double check what your provincial legislation minimum wage rate is, but they're in and around the same. But in addition to that base wage rate, there's also vacation pay that you have to pay that person. There's statutory holiday pay that you have to pay. You have to pay your employer portion of CPP and EI. There's CRA payroll remittances that you'll have, your WSIB premiums. So that's all on top of the person's base wage rate, which I know it sounds common sense, but I think when you kind of get excited about hiring someone, you might kind of forget about that. So that's why it's a good thing to, to go through what those costs are. And then other costs are, you know, do you need an office space for this person? Do you need to start renting a physical space? Or maybe you need to pay for a co-working membership for this person to, to be added onto your company. What about their supplies or their materials? Do you have to buy a laptop, a cell phone, access to specific software and things like that? Um, and most importantly is the training. So any costs to put them on any sort of training courses and, or also the time that it takes you as the business owner or your other employees in your business to train that new person that you're bringing on board. And then in terms of the recruitment costs themselves, obviously the, the cost of posting up a job ad and most importantly, your time it's going to take to go through the resumes, go through the interviews, and go through that whole hiring process from start to finish. In terms of the benefits, um, there's many different benefits. So for example, it might increase your efficiencies in what you do. Maybe you want to pass off some of the administrative work that really bogs down your time, where if someone else takes that up, you can be a lot more efficient in serving your clients better, or it might free up your time to increase sales in your business. It also can give you some more social interaction. So it's not just you anymore and possibly, you know, your dog at home. <laughs> you could have a little bit more social interaction that way. Sometimes it could mean a benefit of increased customer service. Maybe this person that you're thinking of hiring can really focus on that side of your business. There's many different benefits, but the goal here is that you go through this exercise before you go ahead and post the position. So next slide, please. So now you know um, that you're, you're ready to, to, to hire, you know what the costs are and the benefits. And one thing um, that I wanted to kind of bring up before we go through the step-by-step the -step process is that obviously we all have an intention where we're not gonna make a bad hire. Um, but sometimes it happens for a variety of different reasons. But one of the things I wanted to highlight was if you can um, get a step-by-step -step process and really set aside enough time properly, it's, it, it's going to mitigate a lot of the risk of possibly having a bad hire. And I just wanted to kind of um, delve a little bit deep into what some of those costs are. I mean, in terms of hard costs, you're looking at on average um, when you when an employee leaves your company about 16 to 20 percent of their base salary 
that's your cost to replace that person. And that's just a hard cost. You're not even factoring in time there. But I wanted to touch on um, a study that was done from the National Business Research Institute. Now, I know the study was done in 2012, so it was quite some time ago. But I think the effects that the respondents of this study felt at the time are still holding true uh, today in, in, our, in our world of business. So of the respondents, 66% of employers stated that they've experienced negative effects from bad hires in their business. Of that 66%, 37% of them said that bad hires negatively affected employee morale. So it impacted the other employees in the organization. Another 18% said that a bad hire had a negative impact on their client relationships. So it had an impact on their external um, customers. And 43% of those participants in that study said that the need to fill a role quickly was the main reason why they had a bad hire. And and I think this, this situation comes up a lot um, when you're hiring, but I think when you're a much more smaller, medium-sized company, that need to fill the position quickly um, is, is a lot more prevalent. And, and that's because you're a lot more smaller and there's a lot more pressure and, and, and you know, everybody's plate is starting to feel a lot more fuller. So, so that pressure can be a lot greater but you definitely don't want to get into a position where you're, you know, you're just like, okay, I'll take any warm beating heart and, and put them in a seat just so I can keep going on with your work because you don't want any of these bad effects that we just talked about to happen in your business. Next slide, please. So these are the seven steps that I go through um, with my clients when I go ahead and I hire employees for their companies. So the first step is create a targeted job ad and post it online. Once you've posted it though, don't forget to monitor it. And what I mean by monitoring is check to see, you know, are there any resumes coming in? If they are, you know, do, do a brief glance to see, are they the kind of candidates that you're looking for? And if you're not getting enough people or the right people apply, you might need to make some tweaks to the job ad. Once you feel that you've had a good enough response, you can start to screen the resumes. Once you've screened the resumes, you're gonna do an initial phone screen first. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, why that's a really important step. Once the phone interviews are done, you'll then schedule and prepare for your face-to-face -face interviews. Once you've gone through that step, you'll go through checking employment references. Then once employment references and any other kind of background checks you may wanna do, come back as clear then you can move to offer of employment and then go through that actual paperwork stage. And then the last step in the hiring process is kind of thinking about their first day of employment and beyond. It's what I call new hire onboarding. Next slide, please. So your job ad, when you're ready to create your targeted job ad, there are some specific components that have to be um, in, the, in all of your job ads. Obviously you have to have your company name there, a brief description of who you are, what you do, where you're located, the job title, and I'm gonna come back to that um, in a little bit and, and why the job title is super, super important to get correct. A summary of your role, so a brief description of what the position is um, and how it really ties back to, um, to the business as a whole. So how does it help your customers overall is what you want to think about in the summary piece. A list of the responsibilities. Now, what I find a lot of people do is they take that job description and they copy and paste it and put it into their job ad. And so it has that huge long laundry list of responsibilities. You don't want to copy and paste your job description because your job ad, as you're going to see in a second, is very different from your job description. The list of responsibilities here are basically just going to give them um, enough information so they know exactly what the day-to-day -day in the life of this position looks like and, and what you're looking for. In terms of the requirements of the qualifications, so think about um, what sort of education level does this position need? Is it a high school level, post-secondary? Do they need a certification in something very specific? 
Um, what sort of years of experience are you looking for? It is a, is a junior entry level position or is it something that's more where you're looking for, you know, three to five years of experience where someone's been in the workforce for a little bit? Or are you looking for a much more senior seasoned person who can really hit the ground running? You want to think about that as you're creating the job ad. And then list and break out kind of the rest of the skills and experience and soft skills, soft skills that you're looking for and really break them into what I call your must haves and your nice to haves. And your must haves are just that, where if they do not have that skills, knowledge, or experience, they're not able to actually perform the job properly. So list those at the top and then go into your nice to haves which essentially your nice to haves are if they have it, that's great, it's a bonus, it might kind of push them up um, the, the, the screening pile higher, but you know, it's not a deal breaker for you if, if someone doesn't have that. In terms of the job title, because everything now is moved to posting jobs online, it's very rare um, that you'll post in, in a newspaper anymore. Everything has moved to posting on places like Indeed, you have to make sure that you get the job title absolutely correct for a number of reasons. Um, one being that you want to make sure that your job ad comes up in your job seekers search results. Some job seekers will actually use the job title when they're searching for a job. Sometimes they don't. Um, and sometimes you might get the job title incorrect. I was actually speaking to someone from an organization and they had a job posting for a position that internally they called a senior project developer position. They had it posted up on their career site um, and posted up um, through their social media sites and they weren't really getting that many applicants apply at all. So I asked them, what does the job do? You know, tell me about the job. What is it? What does it do? And after they described it, when I hear of senior project developer, especially when you put project developer together in a title, I think of an IT type of a position. And most people would think of that. The role was not even close to an IT position at all. It was more of a business development manager role. But that's what they called it internally, which that's fine if you have an internal title absolutely use it from an internal standpoint, but when you're ready to post it out into the job market, call it what it is. Your job title must reflect what the job does. So sometimes, um, you know, if you're too vague or you're too overly creative, it can, it can work against you. So that's why you want to make sure that job title um, is worded correctly. Next slide, please. That's a really good point because I was, I just, while you were, before you started to explain it, I wrote down you know, should it be the internal title or are you creating a title mm -hmm. that would fit? Yeah. So it makes sense. Makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah, exactly. So now um, the difference between the job ad and the job description. So you absolutely need both of these documents in your business. The job ad is what's basically going out to your potential um, employees who you're putting it out there to the market and your job description is a more of an internal document to use within your business. Your job ad is, is just that, it's an advertisement. It's more shorter, it's to the point. You're really marketing your company and marketing the position and basically telling potential job seekers, potential employees really, you know, what makes you different over the other companies that have the exact same role posted out of there. And really, especially now, like right now, the labor market, probably as, as most of the people on the call know, is that it's really hard to, to find good people in general. But it seems like right now, it's, it's really hard to, to, to find people. And it's a very candidate-driven market for a ton of different reasons that I could probably spend a half an hour just talking about that. But the main reason is that... Um, the, the candidates can be really picky and choosy where we are right now. So the employers have to do a lot more than they used to in the past to really market themselves. It's not just about going out and, and getting a job. It's about, you know, having a purpose behind that job, um, you know, making a difference within their company, which then makes a difference in the community that they work in. So you really want to think about, those sort of things in your job ad 
versus kind of the job itself. So what I, what I do for my clients now that, you know, when I first started in recruitment, I never needed to have to do this. I basically just created the job ad and I had tons and tons of resumes. Now we have to be a lot more creative and, and really market it. And so if you can have at, you know, before you even go into the summary of the position in the company, if you can have right at the top, why, why you want to come work for this company, why you want to be in this position, it's going to hook those job seekers in, and then they're going to read the rest of the job posting. Because as we know, nobody reads anything from start to finish nowadays. It's a very much a scan kind of thing. So if you can have that and hook them in right away, then they're going to read on to, you know, okay, this is what the job's about. This sounds really interesting. I'm going to apply to it. Your job description is much more long and more detailed. Like I said, that big laundry list of responsibilities, and it's more used from an internal standpoint to set up, you know, these are the expectations that I have for you as my employee in this position. And you can use it to set up development plans for your employees. You can then um, document performance standards based on what the job description is. So those are the main differences between the two. Next slide. So now you've created your targeted job ad. Where do you post it? Very much like when you are trying to target your ideal clients, you want to go where they hang out. It's the exact same thing with recruitment. Think of where your targeted applicant pool is going to be. Where do they hang out? And there's a lot of different places nowadays um, to post your position. And in the next slide, you're going to see, um, next slide. Uh, there's, this is just kind of a, a brief sampling of, of the places that you can post. Um, there's, there's lots of them that comes up nowadays and, and there's lots of choice. But it really all comes down to where does your target applicant pool hang out? So if you have a very um, professional level or um, niche specific position, um, a lot of professionals um, hang out on LinkedIn. So if, if your target audience is on LinkedIn, then LinkedIn is where you're going to want to post your position. Indeed is kind of that... Um, that catch-all place where, where everybody posts. And I, you know, in addition to other online job boards, Indeed is kind of that main place that I post for my clients. It's a lot more cost-effective than your Workopolises and your Monsters. Uh, I haven't, per, like professionally, I haven't posted on Workopolis since well before I started my company. Um, it's kind of gone the way of the dinosaur. <laughs> I, I, I don't really know why. There's just so much more competition out there. Um, and Indeed really kind of, you know, if, if, if you got a big hiring budget, Indeed's for you. But if you don't have a lot of money to spend on postings, you can still make it quite cost effective to post on Indeed if you're smaller. And I think that's part of the reason why they've gained so much traction. Localwork.ca is another online job board that, again, if you're targeting locally specific to your geographic area, is another good place to post online. Facebook um, is another place that you can post online as well. Um, you can actually put up job ads on Facebook now, which is 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 kind of interesting. And I've had uh, I've had a couple of clients where I've I've gotten I've gotten applicants from them, and I've even gotten applicants where I've taken them to that face to face interview stage. So it's it again it all depends upon that target audience. Uh, college or university job boards. So if your target audience is recent graduates or you have a co op position post your position there as your main one. They're free. So if, if you can, you know, spend a little of little amount of money versus or no money, then then definitely try to utilize those as much as you can. HRDC Job Bank is another free option that's um, th through the, the federal government and provincial government. It's free to post there. It, it's a little bit cumbersome, their system, but once you kind of get in there, it's it's not too, too bad. Um, have a company career page on your website as well. That's another place to to post. And there's there's many many more, and and I, I could talk about it for much longer. But I want to be mindful of people's time. So next slide. So now you've posted the position, and you're ready to review the resumes. But you know you have all of these resumes to review, but 
you know, what do you do? How do you do it efficiently? Because time is our most precious commodity as business owners. So basically what I do is, you know, use the job description, um, you know, kind of the type of person that you're looking for, the experience, use that to compare against the resumes that you're looking at. What I do is I create my A pile and my B pile. My A piles are essentially um, on paper, they're basically meeting about 85 plus percent of those must have skills that are needed for the position. And then my B piles are kind of the people that are usually at about, you know, 50 to 60% of those must have skills where, you know, they're not like superstars like the A's, but in case one of the A's don't work out for whatever reason, I have a couple of people that I can kind of have as backups. Um, because sometimes what happens is, is that someone will look really, really good on paper, but then as soon as you pick up the phone and start to have a phone conversation with them, they are not as good as they look on paper. So, um, so that's why it's good to have a B pile. When you're looking at someone's resume, think of their resume as their, their story to you. They're telling you um, their story of the work experience and why they think that they're a good fit for the position in the company. So look at, you know, directly related work experience, how long they've been with companies, you know, do they spend a lot of time job hopping versus staying a little bit longer at companies? Um, are there any gaps in employment? Now, sometimes those gaps in employment can be explained um, directly on the resume. Sometimes people might, you know, put in their maternity leave or they were, had a contract position or they've started school. But again, you know, when you kind of have those, those gaps of employment and, and they're not necessarily explained right away, if you still think that person is worthy of a phone call, just ask them on the telephone about those gaps. Nine times out of 10, the gap is easily explainable and it's, it's not an issue or a red flag. But definitely kind of, you know, probe on that initial phone screen. Which brings us to the next slide, please. Which is that initial phone screen. And, you know, why would you do this as opposed to, you know, setting up those one-on-one -on -one interviews? You know, you could just say, okay, you know what, there's, there's three resumes, I really, really like them, why don't I just set them up and meet them one-on-one? -on -one? You could do that, but what could also happen is something like this. You know, usually when you meet someone one-on-one, -on -one, you're at least spending 45 minutes to an hour with them. So let's say you set up three interviews. That's three hours out of your day that you're, you're taking away for this. You meet with the first two candidates and within like the first five or 10 minutes after meeting them one-on-one, -on -one, you know they are not the person that you're looking for. You meet with the final candidate and they're okay, but they didn't really kind of wow you in the interview. You definitely want to see more people at this point. So you met with three people, spent three hours of your time, and you have only one person that's kind of so-so. If you do an initial phone screen, you can save a lot more time. So how many phone screens do you need to do? Typically, if I have one job opening with a client, I'll do anywhere between seven to 10 phone screens. Now I know you're saying, well, why would I talk to seven to 10 people? The phone screen is literally a 10 minute call. You're really not spending a whole lot of time on the call, but you're gonna ask some very um, specific questions to them in that 10 minutes. And so um, I'll, I'll go over some, some questions that, that you can definitely ask in this phone screen. And right off the bat, you know, outside of the questions that you're going to ask, you're going to get a really good idea of what your communication skills are right off the bat. So that's another reason to do the phone screen in and of itself. So one good question to ask them on this phone screen is, why are you interested in this position? What made them apply? It'll tell you a good idea of their level of interest in the position. You know, are they really interested in your particular position or are you one of the 50 places that they sent their resume to and they can't even remember, you know, who you are? Another really good question to ask is, what type of work environment do they enjoy working in? 
you yourself, obviously, as the owner or the person doing the hiring, you know what that work environment is like. So when they give you the answer to that question, you're going to have a good idea of, you know, does that fit with what your work environment is? Then you're going to ask them a question around career. So what has been your biggest career achievement to date? Or where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? And the reason why you can ask this question is it'll give you a good idea of, you know, are, are, they, are they truly interested in your company, in the industry that you work in? You know, is this someone that you can have for the longer term? Or are they just using this as a stopgap until they find something um, where they're actually interested in, in their, their actual career itself? So after you've done these seven to 10 phone screens, you know, at 10 minutes each, you're spending just over an hour of your time and talking with many more people and, and doing it much more efficiently. So next slide, please. So now you've done your initial phone screens and you're ready to go to the next step, which is that face-to-face -face interview. What questions do you ask in this face-to-face -face interview? Well, to start off, like once you've, you've kind of, you know, met with them at reception, you'll kind of have a little bit of small talk to, to calm the candidate down and potentially yourself if you've never done interviews before, especially formal interviews. Um, but you'll kind of just start with, you know, did you find the place okay? Would you like a glass of water? That kind of thing. And then, you know, you can just basically um, ask them to start off with, you know, what do you know about our company? What do you know about this position? Because again, it'll reinforce how engaged they are in the process and it'll give you a good idea of what they think the position is as well. Then the rest of the questions that you're gonna ask in the interview are those behavior-based interview questions. And so what behavior-based interview questions are is they are designed in a way that it forces the candidate to use their past work experience to answer a question. So they have to use an example from their past work experience. So it gives you a good idea of them demonstrating the particular skill or experience you're trying to assess. <clears throat> and we'll go over kind of the formula of how you can create those in a second. In terms of how many candidates you should meet with at this stage, what I do typically again for one job opening is you should be meeting with three, no more than four candidates. You really don't need to meet with any more than four because you should be able to choose between those three maximum four people who you're going to hire for that one position. Now, why in some instances would you have three and why would you have four? Really when it kind of comes down to the four is that you have two really strong candidates from that initial phone screen, but you need to see them both more in person to really kind of figure out who kind of wins out over the other type of thing. The last thing is prepare your candidate, let them know that you're gonna be asking them questions where they need to answer by using their past work experience and specific examples. That's the best way to prepare them. And then prepare yourself for the interview. I know it kind of sounds, you know, common sense, but again, you know, if, if you've never done this type of interviewing before, you, you may get nervous and that's totally fine. So block off time in your schedule. And when I say block off time, I mean like actually put it into your calendar. So there's a little notification that reminds you because as we all know, we get bogged down in our busy day to day. The last thing you want to do is be late for that interview because it doesn't necessarily give the best first impression. If you're able to, again, depending upon your physical space, if you can hold it in a room that's completely separate from your office, that's ideal because then it's, um, it's a little bit more relaxed and then you don't have the distractions of, you know, your email on your computer going off or your telephone ringing. And, and, but if you can't do it outside of your office, that's fine too. Just make sure you turn off the notifications on your computer, your phone and things like that. That way you don't get distracted. And make sure you leave time in the face-to-face -face interview for the candidate to ask you questions. You actually want them to ask you questions. For me, it's a red flag if a candidate at this stage of the game doesn't ask you questions. Um, because again, if, if they're asking questions, they're truly engaged and they're really interested in the position. 
So I've kind of had face-to-face -face interviews where, you know, you've really done a, di a deep dive. And then at the end, you know, do you have any questions for us? And it's, no, I don't have any questions. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a bit off-putting. Next slide, please. Um, I have a question here. Yeah. What type of behavioral questions do you ask new graduates where likely the interview mm -hmm. is their first? Yep. So in those cases, you they can use, because um, most likely with, with new graduates and the programs that they've done, they've done um, some sort of project or maybe a co-op position um, at their school. Or if it's um, if it's something that's transferable from another position. So if it's a skill that they've learned at another position that can easily transfer over to this one, then, then that would be sufficient as well. Okay. Okay, next slide. So this is kind of the formula of how you can create your own um, behavior-based interview questions. So the question, the, the key parts of the question is you're gonna need to have a verb, you're going to need to have a task, so something that they've done in the past, and then a tool, something that they used in order to complete the task in the past. So let's say as an example, you're looking for an administrative type of a position, and you need them to have really strong Excel skills. So your question here in this example is, tell me about a specific time when you created a spreadsheet in Microsoft Excel where you, the data linked from one worksheet to another. So if they've done that sort of thing before, you know, if they know how to link data versus just using Excel as a data entry type of a document, they're gonna know how to answer that question. You know, they might say something of, well, you know, I had to, I was working with a sales team as an example, and we, I had to take their, their forecasted numbers and then relate it back and link it back to the, the actual real numbers. So, they're gonna if they've done that task before they're gonna know exactly how to answer it whereas someone who's never done that before you know for example if you know they need to have experience doing pivot tables if they've never done pivot tables before they're most likely going to give you a very high level generalized type of an answer and in some instances the candidates even though they've done that particular task before Sometimes they're just really nervous, especially, you know, if they're just out of school and it's their first ever interview, they must just might be just getting all wrapped up in their nervousness. So they might not think, oh, right, I have to give those specific examples. So if that happens, you know, just kind of, you know, ask for, for the details, probe. And most of the time, once they settle in, when you probe, you know, that once or twice, then they'll keep giving you the detail going forward in the interview. But there are some instances where, for whatever reason, they just don't give you the detail. And if you don't have the detail there, you can't really make a proper assessment. And so usually if they're not giving you the detail, it could be that they just don't have really good interview skills. They don't know how to interview properly, or they just don't know actually how to do the job. So my rule of thumb is I kind of probe about three, no more than four times. And if after that, I'm still getting the two, three word answers and they're not giving me what I'm looking for, I usually just ask a couple of more questions and then I wrap it up as opposed to just, you know, drawing out the, the process any longer than that. Next slide, please. So now you have gone through your face-to-face -face interview stage and you know who you want to select as your final candidate. So you're gonna move into references and offer stage. So reference checks. You're gonna to want to do an employment reference check. Um, depending upon the position, you can do other kind of background checks. Some people do criminal checks. Again, it, it's really dependent upon the position and, um, and your budget too, but there's there's third party companies that do that, but the employment reference check is probably um, still the best way um, to to really finalize that decision for you. And by employment reference checks, I mean calling their previous past supervisors to ask how their job performance was in that particular job. You would be amazed. Sometimes I had one candidate many years ago when I was um, still in the corporate world, I had one um, person 
put forth a reference for me. And so I called him and as I'm asking him the questions, I could just tell, like he was giving me very like short answers and I could tell there was, there's was something there that he wanted to say, but he didn't feel comfortable. So he kind of just said, you know what? I know this person gave me as a reference and he's like, I don't want to, you know, be bad to him in any sort of way. He's like, but he really wasn't that great of an employee. You know, he's like, if I had a chance to rehire him, he's like, I would not rehire him. So, and I, I appreciated his honesty. And had I not checked that individual's reference, we would have ended up hiring him for the position anyway. So that's why it's still really important to check those past supervisor references. Now, in some cases, some companies have very specific policies where they will not comment on job performance at all. And there's really nothing you can do about that. Just ask the candidate if they have another reference to provide. Ideally, how many references do you want to check? If you can check about two to three, that's kind of the, the rule of thumb. Now, again, you have to, you know, judge it case by case. If someone who's just coming out of school, they're not going to have two to three job references. They may have one, they may have two. So if that's the case, you know, they can have one employment reference and then maybe a couple of, you know, personal professional references, you know, maybe some professors at their school um, would, would be sufficient enough. Um, but someone who's been in the, the workforce um, for a little bit longer, they ideally should be able to provide at least two or three. So you've gone through all of the reference checks and you're now ready to, to go to the offer stage. So you're gonna draw up an offer letter and an employment contract. So what you do is you call up the candidate and you make a verbal offer of employment over the telephone. You say that we would like to offer you this position, we're looking at this being your start date, and this is the salary that we're going to offer you. And I'm also going to follow all of this up with an email with your offer letter, employment contract, and your new hire paperwork um, to fill out. So why do you need to have an employment contract? Anytime you bring someone on as an employee, either on your payroll or as an independent subcontractor, you must have a written contract signed, especially, I mean, not especially if they're on your payroll. I mean, you know, verbal agreements are legally binding, but if anything ever goes south, especially, you know, when it's an employer-employee relationship and you get into the courts, the judges really tend to side on the side of the employees rather the employer. And the reason for that is the employer you know, it's their responsibility um, to know the rules and regulations. And your employment contract is basically how it's going to protect you, the business owner, um, you know, from, from certain things. And it's where you can kind of create very specific terms and conditions for the employment. So that's why it's key that you have them sign an employment contract. So what are some of the standard things you should have in an employment contract? Obviously, you're going to have um, on your either printed on your company letterhead or have your company name and address on there. The person's full legal name, the date that you're making this offer of employment, um, make it specify what their job title is, who they're going to report to, who their start date is, or sorry, what their start date is, their pay information, so their base wage rate, um, if they have any health and dental benefits, um, paid vacation. Um, if you don't have a paid vacation, you then obviously have to go under the employment standards legislation. So in Ontario, it's 4% vacation time and two weeks of, sorry, 4% vacation pay and two weeks of unpaid vacation time. So just as a, a quick little um, HR tip, as an employer in Ontario and pretty much all the provinces across, across Canada, you cannot opt out of the minimum employment standards. You have to meet them. There's no, there's no way around it. And then you're going to want to put in there if there's any bonus um, information. Um, definitely have a probationary period in there. A standard probationary period is three months. So within that probation, probationary period of three months, um, before you reach that three month mark, if the employee is not working out um, within Ontario and, and most other provinces in Canada, 
you can then um, end the employment relationship and you don't owe them any notice under employment standards legislation. Um, and also definitely have termination clauses within your employment contract. And then have um, an expiry date for your offer as well. So one thing to keep in mind um, when you do your employment contracts is you always have to have um, consideration there. Um, and the consideration in this case is, so how consideration works from, from an employment law standpoint, and I'm not an employment lawyer, so I, I don't, you know, this is not legal advice or anything, but as an HR professional, I have to know this type of information. Whenever you um, give consideration, the consideration is you're giving something to the potential employee or existing employee in exchange for them to sign the employment contract. When it's a new employee, the consideration or the value that you're giving in exchange is that position that you're hiring them for. Now, with um, the date that they sign the offer, sorry, the, the date that they sign the contract and their start date, make sure that the date that they sign the employment contract is not the same date as their start date. Because a lot of times, you know, people will kind of, you know, do that quick little email to say, you know, we're going to offer you the position, please show up on Monday for your training. And on their first day, they're given that contract and new hire paperwork to sign. If those dates are exactly the same and things go south and you end up in mediation, arbitration, et cetera, whatever's in that contract doesn't hold any water whatsoever because the dates are the same. And what they look at is that you haven't given them the time to review and, con and consider the offer. You force them into that position. So always make sure that those dates are not the same, just as kind of a little tip. The other new hire paperwork that you're going to get them to fill out are your standard provincial and federal tax forms, an employee information sheet that has, you know, their name, address, emergency contact information, SIN number. And that's kind of the essentially their, their new hire paperwork. Now, TBNTs, um, what, what they are, I call them my thanks, but no thanks. And they are when you are going to call those candidates that you're no longer going to move forward with. And yes, you have to call those people. And no, they are not the most funnest phone calls to have. Um, but it's just out of, out of professional respect and courtesy um, to, to call up those people, especially the ones that you did the phone screen with and especially the ones that you did the face-to-face -face interview with. Now that onboarding piece, you know, first day of employment and beyond, where a lot of um, businesses, big and small, kind of get it wrong is that they think, you know, yes, the person signed, they've accepted, I filled the position, I'm done. Well, you're done the hiring process, but you're not done, done. You're never done until the employee essentially kind of at some point leaves the organization. So think about um, how to set up that relationship with your new employee and set it up successfully from day one. There's been studies done out there where if someone has a really bad first day, by the end of the first week, they're seriously contemplating looking for another job. And I know it, it sounds silly, but, but it's true, especially nowadays with, you know, like I think right now millennials are about 50% of the workforce right now. So for them, as we know, they don't have any sense of loyalty. So if what you've told them of what their job is going to be like in the hiring process, and if it's drastically different once they've been in the job, they'll leave and they won't give you any kind of notice or they won't, you know, stick it out to see what happens. They will just literally get up and leave. So things to think about on their first day, make sure things like their computer and their email and their phone is all set up and running so they can really kind of hit the ground running you know, make sure you're there on your first day, on their first day. I've seen instances and I've heard instances where, you know, their manager is literally not there on their first day. So make sure that, you know, the dates can coincide with one another. Take them out for lunch um, as something to do. But the most important part of that onboarding process, and, and I wish I had more time, but I could probably spend an entire webinar just on onboarding, 
is setting up the um, relationship successfully. So set out those expectations, sit down with your new hire, give them a copy of their job description, go over it with them and set out, these are the expectations from a performance standpoint that we expect of you in this position. And then, you know, work with that new employee one-on-one -on -one and start developing, you know, what are their milestones that they're gonna hit over the next three months? Check in with them on a regular basis have conversations with your employees. Um, a lot of smaller business owners think that if they have conversations with their employees that they're going to get into trouble. You're not going to get into trouble. It's part of having employees as part of your business. You need to talk to them and have conversations. And a lot of the times when you have that op open and honest communication from day one, it's, it's just going to make it easier as opposed to not saying anything and crossing your fingers and hopefully it'll go away on its own. And unfortunately that's usually not what happens. And that's it. So the next slide is just a thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, that is not it. Um, rules and regulations. So in Ontario, um, section 5.1 of the Ontario Human Rights Code applies to all of your current employees and any potential employees and you cannot discriminate on any of the protected grounds. Um, the protected grounds, there's I think about 16 of them, so I won't kind of go into exactly what they all are, are, but if anybody wants a list of all of the protected grounds, I can easily email them, them to you. But you really cannot discriminate you know, in your hiring process or any of your employment practices once you've hired employees. The only way you can quote unquote, discriminate against those protected grounds is if you have a bona fide occupational requirement. There's a three part test, which again, if you want um, information on what that test looks like, I can email that to you. But essentially what it is, is that there's something within the position. Um, so for, for, so for example, if you're, you know, a construction employer and you need to be able to have someone lift repeatedly throughout the day, 50 pounds worth of weight, Legally, you can ask that in the interview process, you know, can you lift this properly? Um, and the reason for that the reason why you can ask that question is because in order to do that position, you need to be able to lift 50 pounds worth of weight. Typically, the bona fide occupational requirement comes in those industries where it's, you know, construction, landscaping, uh, manufacturing, general labor type of positions. Next slide and policies. So what sort of policies do you need? Once you've kind of hit that, you know, two to five employees or five to 10, you definitely need to have policies in your business. Which ones do you need and how many? So what you need to start out with are all of your legislative policies you know, at your provincial level. So in Ontario here, there's a certain set of provincial um, policies that you need to have. So for example, you know, parental leave, maternity leave, family caregiver leave, uh, um, sick days, bereavement leave, things like that. So you have to have all of those policies listed out, health and safety. And then in addition to that, you're going to want to create um, some policies that really make sense on how your business operates. As your business grows and you add more employees, you're going to be adding more policies um, to, to your handbook, essentially. But the one that I think any business should have, regardless of how big they are, is a progressive discipline policy. Mm -hmm. And this really sets out the process of how, um, you know, when someone's not performing in their job or they're, you know, not having the expected behavior based on on your policies is how the discipline piece um, works and and how it's going to protect you is by having it be that progressive format so you know your first format is a verbal warning then you get a written warning and then your final warning is is termination so having that policy is absolutely crucial and again it'll just change over time and make sure you review your policies on an annual basis. Are there changes in legislation? Are there changes in your business? So if you review it on an annual basis, it'll make it a lot more easier versus going, oh, we haven't looked at the handbook in five years. Maybe we should do that now, kind of thing. 
And that is the last slide I promise, because the next slide should be a thank you. Yes, I got it right. <laughs> So there's my contact information. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, feel free. And if you want me to email, you know, those protected grounds, the three-part test, or you have any other questions that I can't get to tonight, feel free to reach out to me. Perfect. Thank you. I jotted down some notes here. Um, one thing during the interview process, I know I had a bout of interviews in my other life uh, a couple years ago and no, last year. And what I found that's helpful, especially if you're trying, if you have the three to four people that you're interviewing and you're trying to really make sure you make the right decision, if you have a team or other colleagues that they will be working with, yes. I usually do my interview and hand them off to just mm -hmm. mingle and ask other people questions that they wouldn't feel comfortable asking me. Mm -hmm. right? And at the end of the day, they don't have to work with me closely. They have to work with those set of people. So their opinion of them matters a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that and I found it very helpful because they were able to pick out things that I wouldn't have seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and especially too, if, if pardon. And then sometimes you can have them come in and do a practical, like you have the Microsoft Excel question. And yes. I know if I've done pivot tables five years ago, mm -hmm. I'm not going to remember how to do it now unless mm -hmm. I'm looking at the screen. Yeah. 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 And, and what you can do even with like kind of those practical um, assessments or, or tests is you can even have candidates do that before you bring them into the face-to-face -face interview stage as well, because again, it makes that process a lot more efficient and, and you're not, you know, wasting your time or wasting their time as well. So. Yeah. A lot of technical positions, you do the mm -hmm. exam or whatever it is before you yeah. come in for a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Oh, huh. this is, this is very interesting. I wrote down a lot of things that I need to review. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's so much, especially once you start to have employees, cause you, cause you, they're people. And, and sometimes, you know, people will do things that will make you go, why would you do that? But, but especially when you're, you're managing them. And once you've hired them, as, as long as you're setting out those expectations from day one, you have that open and honest communication and you're checking in on a regular basis, mm -hmm. it does make things easier. And then, you know, once you have those policies in place and, and, and document everything, um, if you talk to any employment lawyer, they will say to you, document, 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 mm -hmm. because, you know, if anything goes south, that's what's going to be your leg to stand on in court because it turns into a he said, she said. And if you don't have anything to back it up, then unfortunately they're going to go on the side of the employee. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, I've, I mean, I, uh, there was one case law I heard one time where um, there was an employee he had been with the organization for like 20 years and he, uh, they ended his employment. He was like a VP of sales. And so when they kind of gave him his severance package, it was based on his original employment contract that he signed when he first started 20 years ago. And oh, he didn't start in the VP of sales. He started in like an entry level position, but they never took into account um, and they never documented all of the movement that he did within the company. Um, so even just document that sort of stuff and, and I have one client now where, you know, they're like, well, I don't have anybody on an employment contract. Can I get them on one? And you can, um, you just have to do, like I said, that whole consideration piece. So once they're an existing employee to get them on the contract, um, you need to give them consideration. So you need to give them something of value and you need mm -hmm. to give them that value has to be something that they wouldn't already be getting. So some people are like, well, we get a annual increase every year. No, you can't use that as the consideration because it's expected. They get it all of the time. It has to be something different. So a promotion, if someone's getting a promotion into a new position and is getting a salary increase because of that, or their vacation entitlement um, is increasing, or if they don't have health benefits, but they're now getting health benefits, mm -hmm that's your opportunity, that's the value and the consideration. So then you can get them on that. And as your employees get into more senior positions, 
you're going to want to have a much more robust contract where there are very specific, you know, termination provisions, severance position or severance provisions and things like that. So, and again, it just goes back to that whole, you know, do that sort of thing on an annual basis and figure out what those opportunities are. Excellent. I've learned a lot of things today. Good. I'm glad. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Uh, what I will do is I will upload this to our YouTube channel. If there's anything you'd like me to send out to the registrants, if you don't mind sending it to me by tomorrow morning or noon, yes. yep. and I'll send out an email by tomorrow evening to everyone. Okay. So they have okay. your contact information. I'll send uh, the last slide with all your contact details. Okay. Yep, perfect. As well as the link to this video and anything you'd like to send them. Perfect. Okay. And then there was one, it, there was one question that says, is there any HR services for small business? Um, there is me. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> me. <laughs> um, so outside of the recruitment, I, I can also help with other, um, other HR services. So again, if that's something, you know, my contact information is there, feel free to reach out and, and we can take things from there. Excellent. And you help with like writing policies and things yes. like that? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, so if, you know, if, if you have policies already, I can review them, make sure they're up to date, um, make sure that the, what you have makes sense based on where your business is now. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any, I can then also create those ones for you as well. Perfect. Yes. So there you go. You can definitely contact her. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Enjoy your night. Hopefully nobody has too much snow to shovel tomorrow. So. <laughs> I have to drive about an hour east tomorrow morning and I'm just going to put on the starter and say a prayer. <laughs> yes. And, and just take your time. You, you get there when you get there. Yes. <laughs> All right, everyone. Okay. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Have a fantastic evening. Bye. <laughs> Bye.